Wonderful. So the phone just tells me that recording is in progress. So we are <laughs> up on live on to the world, Chuck, after a long time. And, and always, always, it, sh it shocks me. We're recording something and you're about as far away from me as a human being can get on the other side of the world, from Los Angeles to Calcutta. That's, that's a long way away. Yeah. It's nighttime here, it's morning there. Yeah, and a few years back, of course, we were, we were kind of uh, bridging this huge geographical gap much more often. You would be here so much, you know, a, a lot of times of the year, and I would be there uh, sometimes. But now with the pandemic and all that, it's really, uh, things have changed, and we, are, we really have to do this from far away. Plus, I'm 69. I can travel to Calcutta. is getting harder, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so I must tell the viewer that uh, when we met, we were you were uh, in your early 50s. 50. Yeah, I was probably 50. Yeah. When we met. Almost and you were. Cushy was just. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Cushy was just born. Yeah, I was, think, yeah. Correct. That was almost, that's almost uh, 18, 19 years we met. Yeah. So for, for viewers who are watching this, I mean, it's, it's interesting to know how we met. Uh, and that part of the story is something that I always leave to you, Chuck, because that's a very interesting. You, the way you talk about that story is much more interesting than the way I talk about it. So, so I, can only so I had. Yeah, it was a Friday I, I evening. Had, yeah, I, I, so I had been a consultant with, I'm, I'm a psychologist by training, then I got an MBA and was working for Deloitte, and I, when the, the e-commerce bubble burst, you know, we all, the, the whole Deloitte just disbanded. So I was trying to start a business using media to educate around things that really mattered. And I had met all these people, you know, and talked to various people including a, a Buddhist teacher here in Los Angeles. So I'm sitting in my office one Friday night, like 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. I mean, I'm never in my office on a Friday night, you know, at home. I have a home office. The phone rings. I never pick up the phone at 9 o'clock on a Friday night in my office. I pick up the phone, and here's this odd accented voice that I couldn't quite, you know, it's taken me a while to understand, you know, kind of Bengali-flavored English. And but I heard Ken McLeod. That was the teacher, the Buddhist teacher's name. Name, and it's something that you were Ken McLeod's office, which is just five or ten miles down the road. And he had mentioned me to you. And could you come by, and and me it's nine o'clock at night on a Friday night? So okay, fine, sure. I mean, Ken McLeod is saying so, and you've got a, a Bengali accent. Come on down. And so you drove down, and we just fell in love right away. I mean, just immediately, just the connection, the synergy, the overlap, what you were doing, what I was trying to do was just a complete fit. And so we just started, I mean, randomly started trying to do stuff. We didn't have no clue whether we shared a mission in life that, you know, and, and we had kind of complementary kinds of skill sets. Although you had a company, a technology company, and I just was some guy with a consulting background. But nonetheless, we started moving forward. Uh, and that, that phone call that Friday night, you know, and the drive down in the dark. And this was, I think, in November. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Cool and, and finding your house. I mean, finding your house was wasn't easy. I mean, he's named that 33rd yeah. up there. In <laughs> right. And there was no GPS. There was no, hey, Siri. <laughs> there was no Siri. <laughs> and there's this guy from India you know, driving around. But he made it. He made it. I wasn't settled in the U.S. I was just traveling to the U.S. So it wasn't like I was driving around the U.S. all the time. Uh, so I, I, of course, I studied there a few years. And, but then when we met, I was well settled here in India. It's just more like a, you know, a, a bobo. A, Traveling, traveling around all of US from here to there and all of India and going to the mountains and the hills and the jungles and the urban areas, trying to meet with people who were doing what I would then call just meaningful work. You know? Right, I was right. Kind of trying to see how I could connect my expertise in technology and media, which is what I had studied in the US and come back and set up uh, India's first education technology media company. And having 
spent the first few years fairly successfully, you know, running after the corporate sector, where where it is easier to be success. I got kind of uh, fed up, as you know, but trying to help the cigarette companies sell more cigarettes, as an example, and, and do the same those kind of things. And that's what has taken me all the way to Ken McLeod and then to you. And, uh, and I must tell the viewers, uh, just, I mean, Chuck mentioned that he's a psychologist with a PhD and with, with uh, Deloitte and MBA and all that. All that you will find on his LinkedIn also. Maybe. Uh, I haven't seen my LinkedIn and it may have cobwebs on it. It's been a long time since I've looked at LinkedIn. <laughs> Retired, I have no, you know, I have no need to link. But my LinkedIn should now say golfer, photographer, and meditator. <laughs> <laughs> Good, yeah, I, just as we were preparing for this particular recording, uh, just before we got in, Chuck mentioned that he actually, I mean, absolutely has no intention. I, I was telling him that people do not, we are not yet hot shot heroes, and so people don't yet know us. We need to introduce us to them, and he said that, that I have no intention of getting, becoming a hot shot hero this lifetime, at least. Uh, yeah, but, I but I think... Well, but, but I do have an interest. I do have an interest, though, in something that's the same mission that joined us those 19 years ago. And that is to convey a sense of purpose and beauty and to influence people when I can to follow their own pursuit towards greater sanity. That this is, you know, 19 years ago, I was, a world, I was aware that the world was pretty crazy. 35 years ago, I was aware that the world was pretty crazy. And I'm definitely aware that the world is pretty crazy in 2021. And so what little bit, little tiny bit I can do to influence people towards greater sanity, I do want to do that. That's mm -hmm. kind of part of the purpose. You know, you at some point in life, you start thinking about the purpose of your being and what really matters to you. And that's, that's kind of where I am. Because I, fortunately, I don't have to do any commerce. I've retired. I'm not, I'm not wealthy, but I'm not poor. I have a reasonable life and I can sustain it. And so I don't have to generate money, which is a great freedom, I have to tell you. And so I can really be earnest in just conveying what I think is important to convey. Yeah, so and I don't have to... most, people, most people in India would consider that an understatement of the century when uh, Chuck says that he's uh, you know, not poor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are... Been, a lot of people in India would be listening to this. Uh, Chuck, I mean, when I met Chuck, his this is he's a, a big lot. Uh, his house is just next to next to the ocean in a in one of the most in the prettiest uh, small towns near Los Angeles. I mean, in the U.S. But this is just next to Los Angeles, right next to the ocean. That's where he lives. But what I must tell you, and that's what I had, and I just started introducing Chuck. To it, uh, in, in, the, in, in these terms, and because then I said this LinkedIn will never say this. Well, it, it turns out that this LinkedIn might not even say that he's a PhD psychologist and a Deloitte and an MBA from UCLA and all that. But still, what is important, much more important than that, is the way I teach up. You know, uh, he's one, one, and the only person I have met a lot of people in the US um, who finally actually spent at least uh, close to 10 or 12 years and almost every year, uh, more than three, sometimes three months, sometimes four months, sometimes six months, coming all the way to India and staying here, living here in what we have always called our ashram. And the ashram really means, you know, it is, it is uh, you get to sleep on the uh, kind of mats which are not really as cozy as uh, as, as they are in the U.S., <laughs> to, to put it mildly, and with mosquitoes and all of that, there would be time when <laughs> eyes are closed, <laughs> insect bites and all that, and all that was. Oh my God! Remember the insect bite where the bite eye swelled up from a spider bite one night? Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, and, but none of that would would deter him from kind of uh, keeping at it and coming here and spending the time and. The most important thing is that none of that would come with any complaint. I mean, every day he would wake up and just get out on his run and going around the bike and looking at 
stray dogs and feeling happy about living under stray dogs in India and all that. So that's the most amazing part of uh, of Jack and the way I have seen him. Um, of course, all degrees and qualifications and, and achievements apart, these are small things that it's very difficult to describe. And of course, the other uh, other part of the story about Chuck, which always strikes me, and I will always narrate this in, in my introduction about him, no matter what the forum is, that uh, the reason or, or the specific occasion where he left uh, his practice, you know, like he, he was a practicing child psychologist in the U.S. for almost 10 years, Chuck? Yeah, uh-huh. Right at 10 years. 10 years of practice and, and you know, viewers will know, most viewers will know that a child, practicing as a child psychologist, um, child psychiatrist or psychologist? What do you psychologist. Say? Psych- psych- a psychiatrist. psychiatrist is it. Yeah, they're, they're an MD, I'm a PhD. They're different, different licenses. So when you have a license, for, for practicing as a child psychologist in the U.S. that makes you not just not poor, but actually makes you wealthy and many other things. So, um, but, the, but when I first learned why he had dumped his practicing license, that was something that touched me deep within. And, and again, um, I would want you to, I mean, because I had heard it from you, Chuck, and, and me talking about it is never as... Uh, as really, you know, gives the same touch as so, so I would really like you to you know, narrate that particular incident where you, uh, when you decided that it triggered that uh, thought to just dump your license and not uh, continue your practice anymore. Well, there, there were, uh, there, was, it, there were many reasons behind it, but the, the two main ones, I think the one that you're referring to, I'll talk to first, and the other one that's pertinent though, is. So I, I marketed my practice to schools. Schools would have kids that acted out and had behavior issues and, and they would be referred to me. And, and my training and my uh, dissertation were all around individual psychotherapy with children, which I really enjoyed doing. But as I you know, got, gained experience, I realized that it wasn't, the child was just responding to the craziness at home. So then, you know, I, I learned to, to bring, fa- it's called family systems therapy, bring the mom and dad, maybe the brothers and sisters in and, and work with them. And then it really, it struck me mainly it was the mom and the dad. And so the kids would drop out and the mom and the dad, and they were just, so I had a, a I had one diagnostic, diagnostic criteria, AFU, all fucked up. If you were AFU, <laughs> And just you're just like so they were they played ping pong with their children in this power struggle. If you were AFU and they and they weren't motivated to change, they wanted me to fix the other guy. Then the only treatment plan was to take them out behind the barn and shoot them. So when I got to that point where I thought I should take them out behind the barn and shoot them because there was no no solving this dilemma, they were so lost from their own humanity. Then I thought that's the time to change practice. And, and the second reason is I I, I actually wanted. To, there was more to who I am than just talking with people about their lives. I wanted to build and create something. Uh, so, and, and make more money and all that stuff that went along with it. Although the making money yeah, over time, that was a, that was a misguided motive. Uh, but, but so, but it was really, it was, it was the, the disappointment in seeing so many people who just had no willingness to, uh, to embrace their own responsibility for the chaos they created. And always the blaming of the other, the circumstance, you know, either their partner or, the, you know, whatever, um, um, whatever was going wrong. And, and, that, and that remains part of the core thesis that when I decide, I still work with some people just because I enjoy it and because I'm, I, I, whatever I do, I, this is what I do the best of all the things I do is I work with people individually. If they are of a certain mindset, if they have the maturity to accept responsibility for the world that they live in and create, then I absolutely love it. I just, I, I refereed so many divorces and I just, like I said, I got to the point where the diagnosis was AFU, all fucked up. And if, if they were, the only treatment plan was take them behind the barn and shoot them. So that's, that was that. But and so the thing, the thing though, so I did come to India a lot. I mean, towards the last five or eight years, I would come three months 
I would be in India. I'd come home for three months. I'd go to India for three months. So I was there six months a year. And the reason I did that, it wasn't, it was, I mean, I did love Moist Baton. I did like, I loved being in that village. I really did. Uh, and running out on the water bodies in, in the morning. I go, okay, I'm just going to, so I'd run in the morning for four or five miles. And I would run out into the villages out at Moist Baton. And this first time I did that, this one lady, this young lady was getting water out of the pump. And she looked at me, here's this middle-aged white guy you know, running by in the village. She looked at me as if she had seen a flying saucer, honest to goodness. It was like, wow, what the heck is that? But the reason I did that is that you and I, we, we, what we were trying to do, which was to reach out to, you know, a, a really, we had the capacity, the potential to bring people's lives up and to do that at scale and to try to impact their lives and to really, you know, introduce a revolution of sorts. That was to, to be a part of India's growing up or emerging that, that 1 billion of its 1.4 billion people that live in poverty to impact their lives in a positive way. That was very exciting to me. That's what got me willing to get spider bikes on the eye that swelled up and had an arm that froze up one time and all kinds of stuff happened while I was in <laughs> India. But that's why, because the mission that we, the, the mission that you came to LA that night, I mean, as we finally realized it, as we wandered around trying to how to, as we executed that mission, it was very exciting. There were lots of ups, lots of downs, all that kind of stuff, but it was wonderful to try to do, to, to really try to impact a large number of people in a positive way. Yeah. Still at it, still at it. It's a long way to go, it's not easy, but of course, uh, I think what has happened is that the whole pandemic has created a completely new world. And, and, um, but just, I mean, uh, it would be also nice, Chuck, if, if you can kind of um, pinpoint as to why you stuck on, you know, because it's not easy for someone like you to stick on to this. I mean, of course, you talked about the mission and all that, but there's something that you've always mentioned, that the real reason to pursue any mission, do any work, is for the sake of the company that you get, for the people with whom you get together and do something. I mean, that, that's something that I... Uh, almost for the first time when I heard it was you saying it and I always attribute that uh, wisdom to you because you say that we engage ourselves in different work, different pursuits, you know, professional pursuits or, uh, you know, other pursuits primarily because of the, what we call satsang, you know, for the company of the people that we kind of feel. Uh, what was it that you reached out with this German guy? We have, oh, so we call the series The Turban and the Tie. So as you can see, I'm here with the turban and Chuck is there with the tie. And, and I am wearing a tie because of this video. I don't wear a tie very often these days. <laughs> <laughs> so we started the series long back. I mean, much much before podcasts were became were became popular, etc. I think we started the series of recordings when Chuck used to come here, uh, but those were live, those were not using Zoom calls, so they were live sitting in the same room, and we, we would, I mean, viewers would still find some of those videos on YouTube, on our channel somewhere. Uh, but we decided to kind of revive that now uh, once again, because a lot more people are tuned in, tuning into these kind of podcasts. The time when we first did this series many years back, called The Turban and the Tide, which was really a meeting of the East and the West, that was probably a little ahead of its time. And now we've come back with the same mission, but Mike, uh, to bring together, bring to people a kind of integration of the East West and look at this integration on how people can solve these problems. But then I want you to get back, Chuck, as to why you stuck on with this urban guy. Well, so, so the thing, the thing I've always believed in my heart of hearts, way down deep and for 40 years, was that I was a member of a team. And this team wasn't like formally composed. It was a mission of people who had the same intention, the same spirit, the same drive that I did, which is to manifest beauty, to, con to become as close to the real God, the authentic reality of our being, and to bring it forth in sort of collaboration together. To, you know, it's like a large symphony with the conductor is invisible and learning to play in tune. And, that, and so as I go through my own process of growth, I, I think that the 
ability to form relationships based on deep wisdom, deep clarity, deep love, deep compassion, deep, you know, synergy, and, and really focused on what matters most, you know, and collaborate there. That is really, I mean, that, that is what I continue to learn matters to me. That connection with people, you know, and I don't care where you are on a growth pattern. I don't care where I am. If we're just aiming in the same direction, then we're on the same team. And you, you play one position, you know, you're in the midfielder and I'm a goalie. And we're just going forward, you know, to play together as well as we can. And there's just, that's, there, that's kind of the glue of life. You know, it, it's, it, it's one thing for me to meditate. And I, I deeply love meditating. I just, and as time goes by, I like it even better. You know, it's learning how to do it. It takes a while to learn. But then the glue of it is, is, the, is the coming, is the meeting of the heart. It really, that's what it is. It's the meeting of the heart. It's the meeting of the goodness and the celebration of life between us. And that's really, that's what brought me back. To, I mean, it was you, you know, you, Rena, Ram. I mean, you know, the people and the, the team, the guys that we worked with. Uh, you know, I, I these will get, became my beloved friends, my brothers. You, you know, so that's why. And, and, and I always lost, and I, I and I always lost weight, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah, I always, which I, which yeah, I need to do. Yeah. Some, uh, well, so, so this yeah, feels yeah, this out of celebration that the. The almost unending arguments we would have as to you know, oh, yeah. what would <laughs> But there was something that. that we did. Uh, there was a guy that we met, I think we were in Mumbai, might have been Delhi, and I forgot who he was. And we were just talking about the whole concept with him. And we elevated his mind. We saw it. You know, he joined in us. Now, and it was exciting. It was so exciting to see this man, this banker, I think he was an investment banker, come up in his optimism about life. And then, of course, you know, a day later after we left, it collapsed down, you know, and there was no fixing that. But, but the power of that elevation that we, that we jointly had, that was totally exciting. That's just one of the most exciting things. Now, I also want to say this, and this is something that you and I need to work on, and we're going to work on it right now, is we need to limit these conversations. We probably, we're probably at 10 or 15 minutes now, and that's probably long enough. Yeah. So and this is uh, you. You you are you are that person. You know how I am the time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's clock. What? So let's let's. This was a, this was so much fun to relive. I hope that people that are watching it sm get a feel for the flavor of what it is that we jointly are trying to to do together and who we are. And. So we'll just conclude by by making it clear as to what in this inning, you know, this this renewed innings right now, what we are trying to do. So uh, I must tell all all viewers and listeners that there was a, a kind of a demand that we realized here yeah, when I when people saw it, it was a chance meeting sometime back, and, and some of the, some of my friends who were around, they saw that Chuck was available in our system, you know, as part of the he's one of the co-founders of the Kalmyok for. 21st century movement, and then people who are already being touched by these, uh, this movement here in India. Uh, I don't know so much about what the effect in the US, but here in India, uh, people have been really uh, pushed to the wall in terms of the psychological uh, pressure that they have felt because of the lockdown more than the pandemic itself. Of course, the pandemic has, has done what it has, uh, but the primary uh, factors that have led to people's psycho psychological or psycho-spiritual erosion is, is the lockdown, yeah. especially with family and with children. So a lot yeah. of people have thought uh, that here was a child psychologist from US, you know, established, so well-known, etc. Uh, and I, just as I mentioned a little bit about that, everyone said we must get him more, you know, to do help us out of the mess that we are in. And that's what we're trying to do. So in the next, over the next uh, maybe 12 sessions, we will have conversations around this topic, you know, this issue. How would you, I think you were uh, putting in words, putting, putting. 
Whoops. Your video. So, so I, I want to add one thing to that. And just not only am I a child psychologist, but my wife was a teacher for 52 years, one of the longest serving teachers in Los Angeles County in history. And, and uh, just a marvelous teacher. Just we can't go for a walk at the beach without her being stopped three times in an hour by some student or parent, you know, and just deeply beloved. And has remained, even though she's retired, remained in very close contact with the school, the school board, and teachers, and has a, a deep understanding also, and has kept me apprised of what teachers and students and parents are going through in the pandemic and the lockdown here. So, and and if it's appropriate, we'll bring her into the conversation as well. But but that's oh, but that's kind of yeah. It, it will be I think so. Absolutely, it will be, it will be wonderful to have Rowan into this, uh, you know, at, at whatever time you think it is right. Um, I must mention that Ro is not just, is, is one step more than uh, what Chuck already mentioned. She's in the Hall of Fame along with uh, Sharapova, the same, I mean, on the same day. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that was funny. Okay, that's a story for a different time. Yeah, okay. So that's okay. the agenda. To yeah. kind of get to that point where people can find some value in our conversations about uh, how they approach this whole issue of the of being locked down with the children, especially. So yeah, over the next beautiful. 12 episodes, that's what we're going to explore. Beautiful. So long for now. Beautiful. Okay, see you, buddy. Bye, Jack. Bye, everyone. <laughs>